morning everybody today we will be talking about uh, zygomatico maxillary complex fractures and blow out fractures so it comes under the topic comes under maxillofacial trauma and uh, let's see what are the contents so before going into zygomatic complex fractures we should know the normal surgical anatomy of that area and how the fractures are classified what are the mechanism of injury and if at all if you are suspecting any zygomatic complex fracture how to go about uh, completing a clinical examination then what are the signs and symptoms of a zygomatic complex fractures and what are the radiographic assessment and uh, coming to the treatment what are the steps in treatment of zygomatic complex fractures and uh, what is a different treatment option for an isolated arch fracture and its approaches then open fixation of fractures and approaches and what is open reduction and internal fixation in that what is one point two point three point and four point fixations and what are the complications so these are the uh, main contents which is included in this presentation. So, coming to the introduction, the zygomatic bone or zygoma is a strong buttress of the lateral portion of the middle third of the facial skeleton. So, because of this dominant or prominent position, it is frequently fractured. So, along or it can be fractured along with other bones of the mid face. Then the displacement and combination of the fracture fragment parallel the direction and magnitude of the forces of injury and the action of muscle attachment. So let's see what are the surgical anatomy. So the zygomatic complex is a thick, strong bone and is roughly quadrilateral in shape. So you can see the malar prominence there. And a disarticulated zygoma has four processes. It has a frontal process, it has a temporal process, it has an orbital process, a maxillary process, and the lateral portion of the orbit is also included in that. So, what are the muscle attachments? The zygoma provides attachment to the masseter muscle across the inferior surface of zygomatic arch. And one more important uh, muscle that is your temporalis, which passes beneath the arch. And the zygomatic major and minor support the oral commissure, taking origin from the anterior surface of malar eminence. And uh, the zygomatic head of the levator labi superior oris originates just above the infra orbital foramen. Okay, so now let's uh, look into the nerves. What are the nerves passing through that area? So, uh, the zygomatic uh, nerve enters the orbit via infraorbital foramen. Then it divides into zygomatico facial and zygomatico temporal. So, the zygomatico facial bone passes via your zygomatico facial foramen. And your zygomatico temporal uh, nerve passes via your zygomatico temporal foramen, which supplies cheek prominence and temple region, respectively. So, your zygomatico facial uh, provides supply to your cheek prominence, and your zygomatico temporal provides uh, supply to your temple region. Okay. Then the infraorbital nerve, uh, which passes through your infraorbital groove and infraorbital foramen of maxilla. And uh, the infraorbital nerve is a very uh, commonly injured nerve during zygomatic complex fractures because it is usually disrupted due to trauma. So these are the pictorial representation of you can see zygomatico temporal nerve, uh, zygomatico. Uh, Zygomatic of facial nerve and infra orbital nerve. Now, coming to the classification, Rowe and Killy in 1968 classified zygomatic complex fracture 
as type 1 to 4. So type 1 means there is no significant displacement. Then type 2 means there is fracture of the zygomatic arch. Then type 3 means a rotation around the vertical axis that is inward displacement of orbital rim and outward displacement of orbital rim. Then type 4, the rotation around the longitudinal axis. So in that, there is medial displacement of the frontal process and lateral displacement of frontal process. Then type uh, 5 means displacement of the complex N block, that is medial, inferior and lateral. Then type 6 means displacement of orbital antral partition, that is inferiorly and superiorly. Then type 7 means displacement of orbital rim segments and type 8 means complex comminuted fractures. So these are one classification given by Killy, uh, Rowe and Killy in 1968. It is classified as type 1 to type 8. Then Jackson's classification in 1989, they discussed uh, as group 1 to group 4 fractures. So in group one, you can see undisplaced fracture. So in uh, undisplaced fracture, they mentioned that no treatment is required, only conservative approaches uh, needed. Then group two is a localized segmental fracture in that elevation and stabilization is required. In group three fractures, there is a displaced tripod fractures. That means low velocity injuries. So. For such fractures, you need simple elevation or exposure or elevation and fixation. Then your group four, that is displaced commutated fracture, which is due to high velocity injuries, which requires wide exposure and multiple point fixation. So in Jackson's classification, they mentioned the treatment also along with the fracture classification. So what are the mechanism of zygomatic Fractures. Usually, a zygomatic complex injury results from uh, either a road traffic accident or a fall from height or uh, interpersonal violence. So, these are the main uh, reasons for your uh, zygomatic co complex fractures or any facial bone fractures for that matter. These are the main. Or uh, one more thing is your sports injury. So, these are the four common uh, etiological fractures for your facial bone fractures, okay? So, um, mechanism of zygomatic complex fracture is it, the direct impact to the bone causing fracture of one or more processes. So, we discussed about the different processes. So, direct impact on that for any of the processes can cause fracture, the entire complex fracture. So, it mostly strikes the malar region causing inbending at the area of impaction and a reciprocal outbending at the weak areas distant to the point of impact. So why it is striking the malar prominences commonly is that because your malar region is weakly or it is uh, projected out. Your malar prominence is most projected area on your face so that your malar area will be striking it first. Okay. So initially, the first fracture of the zygoma is seen in the posterior wall of maxillary sinus, okay? Then a uh, violent blow to the contralateral face will even cause a displaced fracture of zygoma by a reciprocal uh, transfer of force from the opposite side of facial skeleton, okay? Then the most common is leafwood combo with your zygomatic component on the side of greatest impact and number of fractures of opposite side. So bilateral fractures are seen in highly energy impacts and zygomatic fractures are displaced posteriorly and inferiorly, sometimes posterior inferiorly and medially. Then more extensive injuries are displaced posterior, inferior and laterally. The arch and soft tissue must be disrupted for extensive injuries in several planes. So coming to the clinical examination. So what are the clinical examination we need to do in order to uh, diagnose a zygomatic complex fractures. So it should be performed from the frontal lateral 
and superior aspects then you should first note the symmetry of the face if uh, there is asymmetry we can suspect a fracture but not always facial asymmetry is a uh, sign for bone or any facial bone fracture it can occur due to edema also then pupillary levels and presence of orbital edema and subconjunctival ecchymosis and anterior and lateral projection of your zygomatic bodies okay and the most useful method of evaluating the position of the body of the zygoma is from the superior view that is your bird's eye view your bird's eye view will give a, a clear indication as the, the if there is defect or if there is any uh, asymmetry of your malar prominences on uh, on one side your uh, bird's eye view will clearly suggest you that okay then palpation of the infra orbital rim fronto zygomatico suture body of the zygoma and arch then intra oral examination to evaluate buccal ecchymosis in the superior buccal sulcus these are all uh, common uh, in inspection or examination you should carry out for any facial bone fracture if you are suspecting any facial bone fracture these are the common examination that you should carry out so these are the pictorial representation that see the bird's eye view they are uh, comparing both sides for uh, any uh, symmetries and they are palpating on both sides zygomatic arch on both sides by manual palpation then interpupillary distance uh, they are measuring uh, if at all any orbital component injury is there we can uh, see there is uh, change in your interpupillary distance so they are looking out for that then this is palpation of your intraoral buccal vestibule for any ecchymosis or tenderness if at all your anterior wall or any uh, maxillary sinus uh, fracture is there you can see crepitus or tenderness in that region so what are the signs and symptoms there is periorbital ecchymosis and edema edema and bleeding to the loose connective tissue of the eyelids and periorbital areas the ecchymosis may be in the inferior lid and intraorbital area only or around the entire orbital rim if the hematoma is confined to the distribution of the orbital septum it produces an appearance of a spectacle hematoma then as i said there is flattening of the malar prominences common finding in zmc injuries reported in 70 to 86 percentage of cases those in which distraction of the fz suture and medial rotation or combination have occurred so if edema is present flattening may be difficult to discern soon after injury so we have to wait for the edema to settle down uh, but we can before in hand we can assess through your radiographic examination whether fracture is there or not but uh, we should assess for normal flattening if at all any <clears throat> if at all any uh, what do you call it aesthetic defect is there we have to wait till the uh, edema subsides because if at all any aesthetic defect is there we can assess only once the edema subsides then only we can assess whether uh, surgical approach is required or any conservative approach may be needed okay so one can usually gain an appreciation of this sign by depressing the index fingers into the soft tissue of the zygomatic areas and comparing then there will be pain severe pain is normally not a feature of zygomatic injuries unless the fractured segment is mobile palpation of the fracture sites also elicits a painful response so then ecchymosis of the maxillary buccal sulcus an important sign of zygomatic fracture is ecchymosis in the maxillary buccal sulcus ecchymosis may occur even with a small disruption of the anterior or lateral maxilla deformity at the zygomatic buttress of the maxilla intraoral palpation of the anterior and lateral aspect of maxilla frequently reveals irregularities of the normally smooth contour especially in the area of the zygomatic buttress of maxilla so crepitation from comminuted fragments of the bone is is also frequently palpable okay then deformity of the orbital margins so fractures running through the orbital rim often result in a gap or step deformity if displacement has occurred so if there is a step deformity we can clearly palpate through our fingers okay then the next thing is trismus 
so the uh, why there is a trismus as the picture suggest there can be impingement of your translating coronoid process of the mandible on the displaced zygomatic fragments so also muscle spasm secondary into impingement by the displaced fragments so especially on the temporal muscle so this causes trismus so there is abnormal nerve sensibility that means uh, 50 to 90 percentage of zygomatic complex injuries is associated with impaired sensation of the infraorbital nerve and there is infraorbital nerve paresthesia here is more common in fractures that are displaced than those that are not so infraorbital anesthesia occurs when the fracture through the orbital floor uh, or the anterior maxilla causes tearing shearing or compression of the infraorbital nerve along its canal or foramen then epistaxis whenever the sinus mucosa is disrupted hemorrhage into the sinus is possible and the maxillary sinus drains to middle meters of nose so we can definitely expect epistaxis it can be unilateral or if it's a bilateral fracture we can expect bilateral epistaxis so unilateral epistaxis in 30 to 50 percent of cases is noted so this is the mechanism of injury and this is uh, causing abnormal nerve sensibility in your infraorbital nerve so we will be discussing the other topics in upcoming classes thank you